So the question of how you meet the needs of an ageing society is probably the hardest one that the next few governments will have to answer. Now, lots of people think of ageing society as basically being about the slow burn of longevity, of rising life expectancies, and that's been a part of it. But actually, what's driving our ageing society right now in the main isn't that. It's the transfer of the large baby boomer cohort from working age into retirement age. So my first point is don't think of ageing society as kind of this long, slow upward line as life expectancies get longer. What we've got in the next 20 to 30 years is a a massive, massive acceleration of that trend because of this um, shift in large cohorts into um, a different part of their life course. Um, and that's a challenge for this. It's a challenge for families, and it's a challenge for the state because we tend to fund the state on a pay-as-you-go basis. Um, Working-age people pay for the services that young and old consume in the main, and uh, we now have, w- with this big cohort moving into retirement, we need to spend a lot more money on health and care and so forth in the next 20 years. So we need to raise that money in terms of our current tax mix from a much smaller share of working age. So although voters are very divided by age in terms of the support. You know, support. Labour is much more has much stronger support amongst the young. Conservatives have much stronger support amongst the old. Uh, what's interesting is that there are certain things that completely unite the electorate, and, it, I, and I, I, I was just reminding myself of that. And that one is the NHS. And so, although there is a generation, one of the big, one of the biggest generational differences in Britain is love of the welfare state as a thing, um, where we can show you that if you were alive in 1945, you will always have said it was one of the greatest things in this country. And every successive generation, so I'm a baby boom in 1945 to 1965, like many of us in this room, we're less keen than the people who are alive in 1945. But we don't like it, we're just less likely to say it's the best thing ever. Then 66 to 79, um, some of you in this room, less keen. And po- the post-1980 people, you're least likely to say that the welfare state is the best thing, is one of the proudest achievements of Britain. Now, but everybody is united in loving the NHS. Now, how we fund the NHS and what the outcomes of the NHS are over the next few years, and if you look at the manifestos and do the math, and you're going to be much better at this than me, but actually there isn't a huge difference in actually how much money the NHS gets, and it it generally isn't going to be enough, so something radical will probably have to give. We've tended in the centre, um, although perhaps we weren't all rejoicing about the vote, we've tended to uh, try to use the argument to focus attention of employers. By which I mean um, a big shift in employers' attitudes to trying to keep people in the workforce, and that therefore means flexing the the work contract, it means a much more positive approach to older people, it means occupational therapy and support in work. We know what employers need to do. Trying to get them to do it um, is quite a big challenge. But um, we also know, but it hasn't really landed with employers, that there is a remarkable demographic change happening in the labour market in the number of people who are leaving the labour market compared to the number who are entering it from school or university is remarkably different. I can't remember the figures, but it's about an 8 million gap between the two. So we know we're going to have an enormous labour and skills supply in the short term, quite short term. 